Bueno, eh, bienvenidos a este último panel, como se dice en inglés, last but not least. Um, en este último panel contamos con... Uh, primero hablará Didac Gutiérrez. Um, well, I'm going to proceed in English because it's the language of the panel and I think uh, it's better for everyone. So, uh, first we will have uh, Didac speaking. He will be speaking for 30 minutes and then we will have uh, Professor Benguetea uh, replying or discussing uh, some of the issues that uh, were raised uh, for 15 minutes and then we will have around 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A session. Okay, so uh, Didac is the EU researcher director at the Researcher Institute Via Voice, if it's pronounced well, in Paris. Uh, Via Voice is one of the main research institutes in France and it's specialized in public opinion. And he also works as a researcher with the EU French think tanks as the Institute Jacques Delors. Uh, so, Didac, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christina. Well, thank you, everyone. And it's always a, a great delight to be in this city. And for once, I would say thanks to the weather, not despite the weather, because in Paris it's 30 degrees, and it's quite uh, horrendous to be there right now. So, uh, well, in, in any case, thank you, thank you all for for inviting uh, for inviting me. Um, as mentioned by by Christina, I have been working in in France now for the last three years. And, and I, I will divide my presentation in, in two parts. The, the second part will be more devoted to French elections, so I hope you will be interested in, in that topic too, not only the, the, the one that we are covering uh, today. Um, and in fact, one of the, of the main resources of my presentation is from a study that uh, we conducted uh, throughout 2016 in six countries, so France, UK, Germany, Sweden, and Poland um, with DEMOS, which is one of the main think tanks in London, and I was the, the main coordinator of the French case study. So one, some of the things that I will be talking uh, today will be related to, to that study, to that pan-European study, which we titled um, Nothing to Fear But Fear Itself, which is the famous quotation by Roosevelt in 1933. Uh, so that's, that's the study that we'll be covering today. Um, and I would start by saying that, that we have uh, mostly been evaluating the, the political context from the perspective of Jeffrey Alexander, which has defended, and it's, it's, it's a word that we have used in the first panel, that we are living a sort of backlash against uh, the multiculturalist approach to integration. So I think that the word backlash used by, by Professor Golick is quite, quite the, 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 the right one to, to, to describe what we are living now. And I recall, I recall in 2008, um, I was in, in the UK and David Cameron um, said that the multiculturalism uh, is a dangerous and wrong-headed doctrine. So it was already, uh, with the crisis, something that was, uh, was uh, on, the, on the fire, let's say, like that. And, uh, and recently, German discussion has used the term parallel societies, which is also a term that has been used in the second panel uh, to describe this idea of uh, a divisive backlash that has emerged uh, throughout the last decade. So from, from my side, I will, I will point out three symptoms of the new realignment of the politics of fear, as we call it in the study um, across Europe. It's some of the things that we have already covered, but I will say it in different ways. Um, the, the first one is the growing support for authoritarian populist parties, something that uh, Professor Givanau and uh, Professor Inarati has uh, had already told uh, quite a lot. The second is a low and failing trust in political institutions, so that's the main symptom that we have covered during, during the study. And the third one is a hardening of social attitudes regarding immigration and diversity. So as you see, we have, I will mostly be confirming or restating what, what we have already told. Um, the first one is this idea of uh, growing support for authoritarian populist parties. And it's clearly the clearest sign, as, as Professor Givana was saying, of the new scenes of fear uh, in European politics. Um, and probably the Brexit vote represents the high watermark of, of this trend. Um, and I was, I had written here that, however, other national political contexts also reflect this trend. 
Spain represents a significant outlier. So I think that, Cameron, you covered that topic uh, uh, already, and, and I think that uh, what we have discovered, or the national researchers that Elcano uh, did the case study from Spain, uh, were close to a very close similar conclusion of, of your saying that the fact that we don't have a national identity or very clear national identity in Spain uh, might be one of the vaccines against having this kind of um, extreme right or populist parties here in, in Spain. Um, the, the, the thing that we have um, tried to, to say in this study is that we have um, a paradox or a difficulty um, about the rise of authoritarian populist parties in Europe because they, they really seem to be activating citizens and voters, specifically voters, that are considerably broad, broadly to left behind. So the invisible, I think it was Monsalvo de who said, the invisible. And we have the, a, a problem because as researchers we face the challenge of, of examining this growing support for populist parties uh, without the easy hypocrisy of criticizing for criticizing it. Because they are activating, in fact, uh, if, if we decide to follow this idea that we need more people engaged in politics and more engaged in, 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 in voting, let's say, we cannot contempt with simply disapproving the political choice they make. So that's, that's the main paradox that we are living. And on the other hand, to call this surge of populism as a synonym of empowerment, well, it's, it's quite complicated because they, they they, they tend to defend ideas that they are quite the opposite of empowerment. So I think the first, the first symptom that we have analyzed throughout the, the six countries is quite clear, and it takes a little bit the conclusions of the first two panels. There is uh, definitely a growing support for authoritarian populist parties, but there is as well a debate about the eventual degree of empowerment it illustrates, if any. I think that's the question that we need to now going to solve. I mean, the first thing is very obvious, we have a rise of the populist party. The real question is, are they empowering people? Are they uh, creating some kind of empowerment, if any? And that's the, the kind of question I think we could try to, to focus on in on the next years. The second point is this low and failing trust in political institutions. We all agreed, the six national researchers from the six countries, mm -hmm. that probably if we had to choose one specific trend or specific symptom of the new fear in, in politics in Europe would be that one. More than the growing support for authoritarian populist parties and more even than the hardening social attitudes against immigration or diversity. It's the low and failing trust in political institutions which in our opinion, make uh, this new context of fear uh, or politics of fear in, in Europe. Um, and the, the interesting here, uh, the, the, interesting, the interesting thing here is that we, in Europe and in these six countries, we were used to, to see different level of mistrust if we were talking about national institutions or European institutions. And in the vast majority of countries, there was always a kind of privileged, favorable opinion towards European institutions. So we, we kind of had a highly mistrust in uh, national institutions and not European institutions. Well, the crisis, what it has changed in terms of the data, is that this is now leveraged. So the mistrust is equally important towards the European Union and towards the national institutions. That's something that's an evolution of the last five, ten years, which shows that uh, European Union might face in the next European elections, and, I, and in fact in 2014 it was already the case, some of the uh, complexities and difficulties that we are seeing on our national, uh, on national um, case studies. So basically, uh, we have this problem of uh, mistrust, and for the first time, we have a problem of equal mistrust um, towards the European institutions and towards national institutions. Um, there is, uh, however, also the recognition, and uh, the, the German research team had, had pointed out very well this in, in the study, that many of the reasons why people reported this affection or lack of trust with the European Union are in fact related to policy areas outside the EU's competencies. So that's, 
that's I think it's 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 the second um, the second more important point because we can talk about the mistrust uh, against political institutions, but we haven't still solved the original sin of the European Union, which is explaining who does what, uh, why, and, and, and basically how the competences are shared at the, at the European level. And I think that's something that uh, Daniel Inariti and, and his team knows well and define as the necessity to govern the interdependencies. Well, if we have already very identified clearly the second symptom, which is the failing trust in political institutions, we haven't still solved this idea of governing interdependencies. So again, slightly paradox about this second, um, second point. And the, the third point, um, the third point is the hardening of social attitudes on immigration and diversity. Uh, well, we have covered this well, this as well, very, very vastly during the, 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 the two previous panels. Note that just yesterday, uh, the European Commission launched legal action against Hungary, Poland, and Czech Republic for not accepting not even one refugee uh, from their legal obligations of the relocation agreement. So just yesterday, the European Commission, for the first time, launched legal action against three member states for not accepting refugees, not even one. And when you know the reality or the political reality in those countries, you know that they are not accepting refugees because they have elections. And because having a hard stance, anti-refugee and anti-diversity, is a good point when you have elections in, in these countries, and in fact, I would say in almost any of the European countries nowadays. So it's quite, it's quite impressive how these, these attitudes to our, towards refugees and, and immigrants have, have, have changed. I have just two data from the special Eurobarometer uh, 437, which is the special Eurobarometer. Only one has been published about discrimination in the EU in 2015. And it says that citizens, for example, are far less likely to feel comfortable working alongside a Muslim than a Christian, atheist, Jew, or Buddhist. And that similarly, just 50% will feel comfortable with their son or daughter being in a relationship with a Muslim person, with 30% saying they would be uncomfortable. So that's the data in 2015 in, in Europe. And 30% of participants in the special Eurometer belonging to an ethnic minority group said they had experienced discrimination or harassment related to their ethnicity in the previous 12 months. And 22% of those from a religious minority say they had experienced discrimination or harassment on the grounds of their religion of beliefs. These kind of new attitudes and new change of values, uh, as Montserrat was, was saying, we had already seen it on, on we, we, we also seen it in, in this cross-national polling that a lot of research institutes were trying to, to get on. And in, in contrast, in this study, we see that there's, there's a big difference between our liberal attitudes towards same-sex relationships and the feminization of the labor market and on the question of ethnic diversity and immigration. So it's not on the same basket. It's not everything on the same basket. It's not that we are walking backwards in terms of values or, or attitudes. Is that when you see the, what we call liberal values, there are some values that they are keep progressing in Europe. There are two that they are clearly, clearly regressing, which is ethnic uh, diversity and immigration. So the two problems are well identified. And it's not, it's not only about the regression of liberal values. It's about these two particular topics. So that's very interesting, because the same people that say, I'm not in favor of more immigration or ethnic diversity are the same ones that they are saying, I'm in favor of same-sex relationships and same-sex marriage and uh, the feminization of the labor market, for example. So how, this is the same person. These are the same societies. So it's, it's kind of more complex than, than, than we think. And, and particularly striking is a hardening of attitudes in countries that had, had traditionally held very liberal views on, on, on immigration. I mean, again, talking about the, the Elcano Spanish research team, uh, they presented evidence that Spanish public opinion on immigration, which was once a very liberal 
let's say, outlier compared to other European nations, now has moved into line with the EU average. And moreover, the case study polling found that 40% of Spaniards will vote for a party that pledged to reduce immigration. So we were talking about how is it possible that in Spain we don't have an extreme right populist party when you see numbers like this. I mean, 40% will be ready to vote just because they promise them that there will be a reduction of immigration. At least that's some of the polling that we got. I have some, some other examples about Poland, for example. Uh, President uh, Kaczynski accused refugees of, and I text literally, bringing in all kinds of parasites. And in June, June 2016, the country passed new anti-terrorism laws, introducing measures such as the white tapping of foreign citizens without a court order. In Hungary, since regaining the premiership in 2010, Prime Minister Viktor Orban has been criticized for cracking down on the media freedom and political accountability, as well as exploiting terrorist attacks in Europe to spread fear and promote Islamophobia and a narrow ethnic nationalism. And even where populist parties have not formed, uh, the politics of fear has asserted its influence on policy through restrictions on welfare and social security provision more broadly. That's something that you touch also upon, and it's very interesting because the forefront uh, measure of the renegotiation between David Cameron and the European Union was an emergency break on social provisions. So it's not only that we fear this kind of immigrant or, or other, to use the, the, the vocabulary, but it's that we are developing some, some kind of welfare chauvinism. And I think that this, this welfare chauvinism is one of the main, main, uh, main uh, areas where, where we can see these new, these new hardening attitudes towards immigrants and diversity. I just have two more examples of that which relate on the media. We have recollected that um, uh, analysis of national newspapers by the Oxford Migration Observatory in, in the UK show that the most common descriptor for the word immigrants was obviously illegal. And other consistent terms found nearby newspapers included those around legal, legality and security, so terrorist, suspected, sham, and those using water based imagery, flood, influx, wave. So when you take newspapers aggregated, you, you got this. Um, and another, another media, media study conducted by Hobeik and Villeneuve at Counterpoint, which is another excellent think tank in the UK, uh, about the topics of the Front National and the agenda of the French press, the articles containing Islam and Muslim show that journalists have a special interest for the topic only when scandals related to other issues than politics, so educational scandals or social scandals appear. So basically we talk, we have a prejudice, a, an automatism to talk about these kind of issues in a negative way. Now, I will focus on very briefly on, on France and, and on the second part of the, of the presentation because I think it, it, what we have um, witnessed in the last year, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite interesting and it illustrates a little bit the, the European trends at, uh, at, at, at a continental level. Now, the French paradox is that despite being protected from major internal and external crises, is still struggling, it's a country that still struggles to find a reassured state of mind within the new globalized world. That's the paradox, that that's, that's has been always the French paradox. And the result is that the country is sliding backwards into a negative, fearful, and sometimes overcritical mentality about the future of the country. Now, to put it in, another, in, in other words, in France we call that the national sport is French bashing, autodeclinism, so we like to speak on negative terms about ourselves. That's, that's been France forever. And this anxiety is the core feeling that is structuring the new politics of fear in the country. Um, and I quote here the work of Frank Furedi, which for me is the, the best one to explain this specificity in France, that has been pointed this some conscious and more profound origin that transcends particular periods of times. And he says, Fear can be generated from manipulating the public opinion, which is what we are seeing now. But in France, it also exists as a force in its own right, as a fatalistic sensibility 
that coexist with anxieties concerning the future, which in turn disposes the public to feel uncomfortable about managing uncertainty. So to, to, to say it differently, in such a context, fear has become synonym with disagreement in modern political discourse, when in fact it should be analyzed as a symptom of exhaustion, of disengagement, and more importantly, uncertainty and insecurity about the future. So basically, fear is about the vision. It's not only about identity. That's what I'm trying to say here. It's the novelty of what we have found here and, and, and some of the researchers, and when you take the example of France, is that fear and this new fear in Europe is about vision. It's about giving a vision. Without the vision, without the political vision, uh, fear it gets connected with identity. But it goes beyond identity. It goes, it goes to the root of creating a kind of narrative for the country itself, for the national identity, for the, for the national, let's say, community. So vision as a way of stopping fear. That's the main novelty. I think that we are analyzing a lot of fear as a, as a matter related to identity when it should be analyzed as a matter of political vision, maybe. Um, so that's, that's probably the, the, the main things that, that, that I have, uh, that I have in, in mind. I have some data that we can discuss maybe later on. I prefer to give more time to, to discuss among us um, about the, the elections. Just, just maybe a, a, a quick word about, um, about the election of Emmanuel Macron and how this confirms or nuances uh, my, my purpose here today. The first thing is that the, electoral, the electorate sociology of Emmanuel Macron goes in the exact direction of the divisive politics that nurtured the, political, the politics of fear. So say it differently, his electorate is educated, urban, with financial means, pro-European, pro-globalization, profoundly optimist in, in comparison with, the, for example, the, the, the National Front's electorate. So in that sense, Emmanuel Macron confirms all the fractures that we are seeing in any of the countries touched with this politics of fear. So in, in some ways, he's not, he's not different to any others. So we need to find something different about him elsewhere. Because in the terms of the sociology of his electorate, he's not, he's not touching about the invisible. He's not reaching to the invisible. He's still reaching to the same electorate that we have identified in other countries. So I think that for me, there are two real innovations about the, the Emmanuel Macron wave and, 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 and its electoral sociology. The first one is because he managed to win this election convincing people that he was the best tool to achieve political change. So now that's, that's very interesting because in 2012, we asked the French, why are you voting for these candidates? And the first two items were for his, her project and for his, her personality. So basically a normal reaction of electors saying, I'm voting for his party, for his personality, and I'm, voter, and I'm voting for his project. In this election, for the first time, with the same items, the first item that comes up is for political change. So the main driver of this election has been achieving political change, meaning radical change, meaning even revolution in some ways. And his book, in fact, is called Revolution. So in that way, it's extremely, extremely interesting how he managed to convince people that he was the best driver for political change. Without that, you don't win this election with this same electorate. So basically, it was about change again, and it's related exactly what we were saying before, which is about the vision. So he managed to stop fear because he proposed a vision. And that's why the first results of this get connected to the electorate of Emmanuel Macron. Um, and the second thing, um, and it's probably the one overlook um, when, when we analyze the, the, the French elections, is that it's the only candidate that when you take the different age groups, so 1825, 25-35, 35-50, 50-60, he's the only one with a flat line. 
So basically, he gets the same level of support in each of the age group, which is completely different from what we have seen in, in the last Brit British elections, which is completely like we have two opposites. The Conservatives are from less to more, and the Labour are like this. So he, he, he was like this. And it's, I think it's, that's, that's really, I mean, when you try to study the, the, the Macron phenomenon, the only two real things in terms of innovation, of political innovation that I found there, is this, these are the two, which he managed to embody political change when the country wanted political change, and that he managed to get to everyone, to young, to old, to middle, but apart from that, he's exactly the same that we have seen elsewhere. He's the kind of the candidate of the, of the privileged, and we still have the left behind voting for, for some, someone else. So, but that's probably the two innovations about Macron. Um, just to, to close by, um, so I think that the experiences like Macron seem to confirm that more and more we are learning to live with our own fears that sometimes frustration, fear, radical will to change does not lead all the time to extremism. So I would say that if we repeat this same conference in one year, we will have to take into account that not all these elements, fear, frustration, uh, left behind, lead always to extremism. And that's something that it's, it's quite striking from, from the Macron phenomenon. Um, and the, the, second the, the second concluding point like, I would like to, to, to quote a controversy argument made by, by my colleague and co-author of this report, which is Yves Bertoncini, which is the, he's the director of the Institut Jacques Delors, who likes to say that, like many concepts, we have abandoned a positive research around the concept of fear. So basically, we are just saying there's only one way to attack fear, and it's from a negative perspective. But in fact, what he likes to say is that the European Union sh should change the ought to joy to ought to fear and try to re-embody a positive argument about fear. Fear has been used in the last 10 years as a negative concept, as a negative political tool to reach uh, electoral gains. But there might be another way to use fear in the, in the future, um, and that in includes researchers that, that we can that can lead to other experiences or other results, like, for example, the one that we are, have experienced in, in France uh, with Macron. So fear is evolving, and that there might be another way to use it than not uh, necessarily on the, ne on, the negative, uh, on the negative approach. Thanks, Alec Didet, and thanks for sticking to it. It's perfect to the time. And now we have uh, Professor uh, Jose Ramon Mengochea. He is a professor of jurisprudence and sociology of law at the University of West Country and a coordinator of the program EAT GUNE, Rethinking Together. And uh, he's the secretary of ICER Basque, among uh, many other achievements. And so uh, the floor is yours. You have 15 minutes. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, well, I also want to thank um, Governance and um, for staging this very interesting event. Um, unfortunately, I'm not the Secretary of Iker Basque because that would make me very powerful, but uh, I'm uh, the Secretary of Eurobasque, which That's is, right. of course, the, the, the Basque Council of the European Movement. And um, some of what I have to say um, uh, by way of uh, reaction or as a discussant to what Jidak was uh, uh, saying, um, relies precisely on my European hat. So um, I guess that's mostly what I will uh, draw, draw upon. Um, I want to sp specifically react to, I think, three points um, that, that, that I particularly found interesting in your presentation. Um, not so much the concept of fear as such, I'm not going to deal with that, but how, how fear and crisis is turned into opportunity, which I think is partly related to the same um, 
discourse on fear. I want to mention this, um, you may, I think the, the study that you mentioned uh, covered Poland, and, uh, but uh, you mentioned also Hungary and the Czech Republic and, and uh, Slovakia was also mentioned during the day. This, these four countries make up the Visograd group huh? and um, they are proclaiming uh, a sort of new, new vision, new narrative, which they, they call this illiberal democracy. And so what is there about illiberal democracy um, that, that might perhaps tell us about what's happening in Europe? They, they have, um, as you mentioned yesterday, the commission was announcing that it was bringing infringement proceedings against uh, some of these countries, uh, I think Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic, for having refused to apply the decision that was adopted at the Council on the distribution of quotas, uh, which was adopted by a majority, uh, and not by unanimity, because they opposed, but uh, by a majority. And so what would it mean in, in the context of their attitudes also this idea of an Ill illiberal democracy, which is their model, political model of democracy, how does that relate perhaps to populism as it was being dissected in the session before? Um, and then, of course, um, what is the impact of this on, on Europe? I think we have enough with those, with those comments. So um, I would like to start precisely with the, with the Viso Visograd group huh? and this idea of illiberal um, democracy. The idea seems to be, if I can capture it uh, correctly, that um, of, of the legit, legitimate, legitimizing or discourses behind democracy, one can, one, one can find two major strands. One would be majoritarian rule and the other one would be the protection of minorities against the majoritarian rule, precisely. It seems to me that their concept of illiberal democracies precisely gives so much weight to the majoritarian rule that it completely does away with the protection of minorities. And that's, I think that's what's at heart of their, of their political vision. So they would say, yes, um, this might have been decided at the council, but we were against it, and our electorate is against uh, receiving refugees. Refe receiving refugees, unless you can guarantee that the refugees we are receiving are going to be like us. No? So Christian refugees, yes, but no Muslim refugee. That seems to be their attitude, and uh, even Orban um, went as far as calling for a referendum on, uh, to the Hungarian people on whether they would accept or not the quotas that had been decided at European level. Uh, I, uh, I'm sorry, I, I hope you heard what I said and so far. Uh, okay. <laughs> I was not going to restart all over again. So, okay, so the, there is this clash therefore between majoritarian rule and a, a protection of minorities. I think the essence of what our European liberal democracies were about was precisely to find a, a, a balance between the two, the two strands, huh? majoritarian rule and protection of minorities against the majoritarian rule. And this seems to me what, what is being uh, left behind or forgotten or completely abandoned as a strategy of illiberal democracy. It seems to me that this is precisely where populist uh, discourse and populist uh, radical right parties are, are locating themselves. I mean, it's, it's no co coincidence that this seems to be also the view of uh, Putin's uh, poli pol poli politics and um, the admiration that was, uh, that was uh, expressed by uh, candidate Marine Le Pen to Putin's views and to these illiberal democracies. So perhaps this gives us a clue as to 
what is, uh, well, what the discourse is, what the politics are, and then how, how this could fit into a, a construction of Europe. Uh, and how does this narrative have any place at all in, in our uh, shared values, shared visions of Europe? It seems to me that uh, Europe is Europe and European integration is precisely an attempt to try to um, include in a common project, in a common system of decision making as well, include um, majoritarian decision makers at the national level and um, not necessarily until now, except for their, for their um, lip service paid to democracy as a model, not necessarily so much concerned about the protection of minorities. Now, if, if that is so, there would be a real democratic deficit, a serious democratic deficit in the European Union. If it is going to allow visions like those proclaimed by the Visegrad group, uh, if it is going to allow practices that go along uh, that, that vision, not just the discourse, but also the legal practices, then uh, Europe has a serious problem, a serious problem of democratic legitimization and of a democratic deficit. Um, this deficit can be seen in some of the attitudes that the European Union and even the Court of Justice of the, of the European Union have taken towards the possibility of joining the European system of human rights protection, which was subject to one very famous decision, in, uh, not a decision, but an opinion in, in 2013, where the court said that the proposed accession of the European Union to the European Convention of Human Rights was uh, incompatible with the current state of, uh, of, uh, of the Treaty of the Union, of the European Union. It's interesting because, of course, I don't want to uh, go into the details of that opinion, but if it is true that Europe still lacks this um, commitment to human rights protection, and this is, a, uh, this is a big if, huh? I'm not saying that that is so, but it would, it would make sense in the reactions it has had so far against the Visegrad group. It hasn't really done very much about it. Hungary, uh, the Hungarian uh, ruling party is part of the European Popular Party, and the European Popular Party is a majority in the European Parliament. Why is nothing being done about Hungary, for instance? Huh? So, is there, is there some sort of um, hidden, con hidden consent, or hidden per permissive attitude towards these illiberal democracy models? I if that is so, huh? this is just big questions that I'm opening, but if that is so, does that also relate to the not so assertive uh, discourse and narrative concerning human rights, which could be seen uh, in the symptom, for instance, of refusing so far the accession uh, to the European Convention of Human Rights. Um, if that is so, I think this is, this is a, a, a big lack or a big gap in one of the major European narratives. Huh? Um, the, other, the other big gap in the European, uh, and this of course could explain some of the perhaps lo loss or lower trust or fading trust in European institutions. I think the other major narrative, and this is now bringing again the concept of fear and whether we could understand fear in any positive way. This is, very, this is uh, I think, one of the points of um, Ulrich Beck's uh, last uh, book on metamorphosis. Uh, it's, um, risk society was about the negative side effects of progress and positive, and positive goods. Uh, the metamorphosis he's talking about is where you can find uh, a, a possibility 
of uh, positive effects in bads, uh, in evils. Uh, and of course, here, climate change becoming the major source of evil, which can give opportunities to, to, to bring about a change. Uh, and um, I was asking Jidak uh, before, whether or earlier, whether uh, in their analysis of the six major factors of fear, uh, they had detected any, an, any re reaction or any position of climate change and environmental destruction, and apparently that was not uh, uh, majoring amongst the, the, the reactions or the answers of, the, of those interviewed. But it, it seems to me that this is one of the key elements that is going to that is going to bring about this metamorphosis where the old uh, hasn't completely died yet but is transforming into something new. And I think here is a big chance where um, a new narrative, not only for the European Union, but a global narrative where we can share values. It came also in, in the first panel when we were talking about the cross-religious uh, agreement concerning climate change. It seems to me that this is an area where we can find important new values and where a, 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 an obvious element of risk and fear can be turned into positive action um, at, the, at the world level. That it is true that the President Trump has decided that they want to take the US out of the Paris Co-op 21 agreement. Uh, it is not clear how this can be done legally or if it can be done legally and to what extent. But what is clear is that it has engendered many interesting reactions from states across the US and from cities across the US saying, and even from some major firms, huh, saying we are going forward, we are going to take this seriously. And I, I see this as a new symptom, as a, a new phenomenon of working with, with fear in a positive sense in the way that perhaps um, Ulrich Beck was saying, and if we bring this again to the fear of, of populism um, that was um, so strong in the earlier part of this year and of course uh, uh, all along 2016, I think it seems to me that um, in Europe there has been a, a turning point, perhaps having seen the fear of populism, it seems to me, or maybe I'm too optimistic in this reading, there is, there is a reaction a reaction is taking place. In Austria it took place, in, in the Netherlands it took place, uh, in France it's taken place. Um, it seems to me that Brexit in this sense has been an interesting federalizing concept for the, for the, for, for the European Union. Brexit in a way has brought us together. Brexit was the opportunity of leaving. The opportunity of leaving is Article 50, I finish with this uh, point. Article 50 of the Treaty on European Union, it's the last article. It's the omega of European Union. The alpha of European Union is article number one, which expresses the ever closer union amongst the peoples of Europe. It's interesting that these are the alpha and the omega of European integration. The fact that you can leave and that you can decide to leave has had an, an, an amazing effect on the, possible, on the possibility for reaffirming the aim of closer union. And it seems to me that Macron has captured this very specifically and very well. When, when his, his campaign was very pro-Europe, and he's just gone to tell Merkel, that, uh, to tell May, that she can always uh, change her mind, that uh, Brexit is not necessarily a, a a point of no return. And therefore, it seems to me that this um, Brexit uh, fear and populist fear, they are not unrelated, uh, might have come to a turning point and the Europeans might be doing something about it. And the white paper of the European Commission with all its faults, all its mistakes, uh, laying out five possible scenarios on the future of Europe is a good indication, I think, of how maybe the European institutions and the member states in Europe, Merkel, Merkel and Macron, M&M, &M, will probably uh, do, do something about, uh, about this. Of course, not them just personally doing, but the movement that they can inspire might do something about this. So I just leave it there. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Now we have around 15 to 20 minutes for questions and discussion because they have stick to the time perfectly. So thank you both.
So I can, we can proceed by, please, Daniel. Thank you very much for, for coming, especially, especially to Didac and also to Jose Ramon for these uh, excellent uh, presentations. Um, if we take for, for granted that the fear of the right is rather related to cultural issues, national identity, and the fear of the left is rather uh, connected with this uh, economic uncertainty that we are just speaking about. Uh, what do you think about the, the dimension of or the role of the economic, re economic reasons and the cultural reasons uh, by the, the rise of the, of the radical right? This is a question I, I, I should have been addressed to the second panel, but, but we had uh, no more time. But I, I, it could be interest, interesting to, to know your, your opinion, Didac, about this. Uh, to what extent the rise of the political right uh, comes up, up to a cultural or issue or to an uh, economic issue? My personal hypothesis uh, is that uh, the more we are able to address this economic uncertainty, the less the nationalist and uh, xenophobic uh, issues will be on the political agenda. I am not, uh, not especially Marxist, but I am convinced that at the end of the day, the, the source of radical right in, in Europe and in general is more um, that economic uncertainty that than its uh, cultural uh, manifest manifestations. Uh, do you agree with me? Yes, I mean it's, it's my my intuition is exactly the, the the same because when you when 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 we talk about how to use fear as an opportunity, um, we see that it's geopolitics, Brexit and Trump, illiberal democracies, so in terms of constitutional issues and minority uh, protection, climate change, so global challenges, but we we still have we still struggle a lot how to make economical fear in a positive way. We don't talk about pre-distribution or anything like that. We, don't, we, we, we haven't managed to get some kind of positive fear out of economical struggle. And I think that's one of the main challenges for, for the European Union. And related to that, I think that to add to, to, to what you were saying, I would say that connected to that, I will put your argument that you, you, you do quite a lot, which is this idea of interdependencies. I think that you cannot separate the challenge about economical items and the challenge about understanding what causes them. Because, for example, in, in, in the, case, the French case study, we asked, we tried to, to ask people what would be, in their opinion, the possibility of something happening. And we ask, for example, a terrorist attack in the next six months. Nine over ten French people said that they considered probable a terrorist attack. Nine. So everyone. So we live in a, in a panic state. But the most interesting was that we ask um, if a major financial crisis was possible in the next two years. After the last one that we lived. And seven out of ten said yes. So in that sense, I mean, we were expecting three, maybe, okay, go on, 50%. But 7%, it means that everything that we have undertaken at the European level since the crisis, so banking union, stability pact, 
uh, rescue plans, European stability mechanism, further integration in terms of uh, economies and budgets. Nothing is perceived at the, at the public opinion level. We are still feeling as fragile, economically speaking, that we were feeling probably in 2008. So in, in that sense, with that question, I felt that if people, if, if, if those interviews had taken into account all what the European Union and the national governments had been doing in terms of risk, uh, risk calculus in terms of economical uh, instability, maybe we, w we wouldn't have seven out of 10 saying that a fi major financial crisis is coming in the next few years. So I think that, just to add, but I, I, it's true that I don't, I mean, we don't, we don't have um, any particular finding that allows us to say that we have find a way to create, out of an economical fear, something positive. And I think that's the main issue here that you are touching on. But I think that this issue might be connected with this idea of interdependency. Because without understanding what the economical instability is faced, and globalization, in fact, French are still the, 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 the worst ones about globalization. When you ask them, is globalization good for you? They say yes. When you ask them, is globalization good for your region? They say yes. Is globalization good for Europe? Yes. Is globalization good for France? No. So it's, it's, it's this very, um, it is very um, idealistic or national connection about what causes the problem that makes us maybe think differently. And I think it's the, the French, the French, again, I think it's a very interesting country to study the evolution of the politics of fear because they still have this problem of when I understand what causes the problem in terms of economics and it's a matter of, um, of state of mind. Then I, then I change my fear, and then I change my vote. So in the case of, of France, I would say yes to the economical issues, but link with this idea of the state of mind. I'm not very clear on that one, but sorry. Uh, any other question? Ah, under, please. Uh, I guess the question goes for Didac, but it can also be answered by Jose Ramon. You have mentioned that the crisis has generated that the levels of distrust towards the, the EU and the national institutions have somehow leveraged. And I was wondering whether you have uh, taken into account in, in the study uh, the level of knowledge about the EU institutions, because many, many times we see how uh, the, the level of trust uh, uh, is going down or it's going up and in, in up totally different ways as the level of, of knowledge, or the other way around, in the case of Spain, the, together with the crisis came a, a, a higher level of knowledge of the EU institutions, and in the meanwhile, the, the level of trust went down. So I was wondering whether, in comparative terms, the, there, are, uh, there are some patterns that we, we can see there. No, we don't have the data, but it's exactly what I was trying to say, but good, well said by you. I mean, it's, 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 like, it's exactly this. I, we have the impression that a lot of that is connected with, or not connected, but influenced by the kind of, um, the kind of amount of information that we have about the EU. So we are kind of solving the, the crisis of, of uh, this crisis of legitimacy and uh, the electoral elections in 2014 and then 2019 will be even more presidential and maybe that makes a change in terms of, but in terms of the inform informational deficit, well, at least the data that we, we got and in our daily lives, I mean, when you try to see different partners or clients and to, to speak about Europe, the level is still, uh, well, it's still very low. So I, I'm, I'm not sure how, um, yeah, how, how to connect both, but I've, I think there's definitely a, a problem where mistrust is influenced or affected by misinformation or underinformation. Uh, but but no, we don't have the data for trending. Thank you very much. I also wanted to make a comment related to what Daniel was mentioning, um, because that hypothesis is quite 
like uh, I don't know what's what's first uh, so distribution or cultural identity. This is a good question. I, I think the, uh, it's difficult to to give a response because when you analyze three different cases, the case of the United States, the case of Spain, and the case of the Basque Country, you come to different conclusions. I will explain why. You take the case of the United States and you see that Trump, in, in his discourse somehow, he introduced very clearly the economic dimension. And of course he had issues related to the identity, but it seems that they were secondary. And he could connect with these people, white, middle class, and he went straight, the, the trend in the United States with, liber, with uh, international uh, free, uh, free trade and so on. But then you take the case of Spain and, and why the 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 non uh, the, the right wing is not so strong. You could also use the same hypothesis because it's, it has not been said, but Podemos somehow assumed many of this discomfort related to economy. And in their discourse, that's very clear. But the issue of identity is not there, but this issue of, of economic inequality and so is very much part of the discourse they have. So that's also somehow disactivated probably the, 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 the potentiality of other groups. I would say that we are not so safe. I, I'm, in, in Madrid I relate a lot with the police because of things related to radicalization and I see within se certain sectors a lot of extreme uh, like uh, thoughts but they don't express that and also the, the, the popular party also somehow assumes people who are uh, quite extreme, but they then don't say it publicly, so that's also another reason. But then you take the case of, of the Basque country, and there is a, an interesting analysis of the political discourse over the last 30 years, and there is a, a, a Greek uh, researcher, Neophytus, I don't remember his surname, I met him in Essex, he's in Kent University. And he saw that in the Basque country, when you analyze this axis, identity or economic inequalities, you see that when there is economic stability, the, the, the debate was about identity. So economic stability didn't somehow, uh, in those times, called, called identity was more, most important. But then, when there was uh, economic problems, then the debate was about distribution, and not, not much so about identity. So it's very difficult to come to a conclusion. I, I just wanted to share, but I don't have a, a direct response.